it's wonderful to have all of you here, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to introduce one of my classmates from way back from first grade. We didn't go to kindergarten. We're too old for kindergarten. But we had a lot of good times in school, and I see some of the people that remember those days. And I heard people reminiscing about going to school with. So something like this is great to bring in community and get us all together. I do have one announcement for historical people that want to know about a program. Uh, Greenfield is having a program about Greenfield school history, and it's going to be Saturday, November 5th, from 9 to 3 at Greenfield Community College downtown in Greenfield, Mass. So if any of you want to know more about the um, goings on in Greenfield, there's your chance. And our <coughs> The exhibit for me for next year? Yeah. Has that really been firmed? Oh, well, never mind. I don't know. I, I mean, we're, we're talking about lost houses, buildings, and so forth. We're finding a lot of pictures. That's a potential um, theme for us because every year our theme changes in our little one room museum. So, yes, that's a good point, Judy, because people do have pictures of their homes or your grandparents' homes or memorabilia of any sort. Um, Old businesses that aren't here anymore. We got some things from John Mursky tonight, so it's always great to have more things collected because we are really trying to preserve the things that are important to Waitley's history. So don't throw a thing away. <laughs> Bring it by us. We're, we're, getting, we're getting things from Delaware every time David comes north. So it's really, really wonderful to have people thinking of their past. And it's our heritage, so let's preserve it. So without any further ado, and I'm, I have to apologize. Judy, you gave me a nice intro, and I read it, and I said, now wait a minute. He's already told me several of those things. So Judy made a nice introduction for tobacco, and Harold has talked with me several times, and he said, well, I'm going to tell this, and I'm going to tell that. And I said, I can't steal his thunder. So he's going to tell it all. And I've been warned that if he doesn't remember everything, I can go after him. OK, Thank it's you. all yours, Harold. Thank you, Delia. Before we start the program, I'd like to take the pleasure of introducing my protection and associates that are here at the table. My cousin David Swift, who uh, in his, no, I won't say senior years, in his younger years, <laughs> resided across from what we know as our library in the house with the big pointed roof. 203. Uh, 203. 203. Okay. Next to Howard Nestor Wade. Yes. And uh, to my far left is Wayne Hatkowski, who is the most recent generation and one down of uh, growing tobacco and who also spent time with his father, Ronald, in his shade tobacco. And uh, with that, I guess that we can get going uh, with the program. Uh, tobacco was considered the Indian wicked weed. In 1858, according to the first history of Wheatley, the uh, preachers had a meeting in the church. And the purpose of the meeting was how to convince their parishioners not to grow tobacco anymore, not to raise it, not, excuse me, not to raise it. And it went all around amongst the preachers until it finally got to the preacher who represented Wheatley in the church. And they said, well, preacher, you haven't said anything. And he said, well, I'll say it now. I don't care what my parishioners raise as long as they raise my salary. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was a pretty good start along the way. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that, that got it off to a good start. <laughs> the cigar, a cigar consists of three parts. The filler, the binder, and the wrapper. Now the filler is a mixture of tobacco from various places. The binder can either be the type of tobacco you see by Wayne, which uh, uh, 
is uh, broadly, if I guess, yeah. along the way, I don't want to open the bundle because of the humidity in it. And, the, and it also, uh, certain leaves, lighter leaves can be used as a wrapper for cigars. But the most pertinent one that is grown is uh, shade tobacco, and that's basically what I was involved with uh, in my career. Now, tobacco is uh, very basically, uh, Tobacco Valley is very basically runs from Portland, Connecticut to Greenfield, Massachusetts, oh. along the Connecticut River at only a few miles west and east of the river. Over my lifetime in the business, I covered various parts of that area uh, for a consolidated cigar. And the thing that I found out about tobacco farmers is they swear what they do is right. They do it one way here, and then they'll do it the other way over in Sunland or Hadley, and they both say it's right. But let me tell you, when the tobacco goes into the warehouse to be graded, it's the same. <laughs> it's the same. And to give you an example of that, uh, tobacco sheds that we still see, on this side of the river, most of the sheds are 30 feet wide. And on the other side of the river, they're 32 feet wide. <laughs> uh, what does it do? Uh, it gives them uh, straight runs on the other side of the river, and it gives us a, a run on this side of the river where you have to use an angle of lap as opposed to have excuse me, straight across. And what does that do? It allows the air and the heat from the burners to go up through. I don't know who's right. I've seen both go through the warehouse and they look the same to me. But tell the farmers that and you know what he's going to say? No way. <laughs> no way on it. Now, tobacco has changed some since I, I was in it. I guess we got out of it in 2002. Uh, but basically, each operation span is between 45 and 50 days. And you get your seed bed operations uh, that start around the 1st uh, of, uh, of uh, April. Uh, back when uh, I was uh, doing it, uh, they did it as late as 10th of, uh, of April. And they, we also seeded a regular bed. And then they switched over to these little trays where they did each one. Now, as the trays grow, they would take the, the trays and have some laborers pull out many extra plants and leave just one hardy plant in the tray, in that slot. So that took care of that. And then generally, uh, around the first part of, of May, the plants were ready to uh, plant into the ground. And you had to watch the weather. But prior to that, we would let a lot of air into the greenhouse to sort of harden off the plants. So they went into the field and they would take a little cold weather, if you will. It won't take frost, it will take cold weather. So that's what we did there. And then, depending on the crop, the harvest basically uh, uh, started any time after the 1st of, of July uh, along the way. And then uh, the sheds being full, uh, uh, we started taking it down after it was cured uh, around the uh, 1st of uh, September and uh, then it went into the West Warehouse for a sweating or fermentation process. Now, when you are curing tobacco, and it doesn't matter whether you're using charcoal, as it was when I was younger, and briquettes or the gas burners that you see, you have to be careful how much you, heat you give that tobacco. In my heyday, with a short sleeve shirt instead of a long one, I could walk into a tobacco barn and tell you if that barn was curing right just by the feel of the humidity and the heat on my arm. And then I would climb up in the shed and it would correspond with a wet dry bulb thermometer. The problem is if you put a lot of heat to the tobacco first, you'll set it a green cast. And there's nothing that I've ever seen that will turn it from green back to the color you want. Nothing. So it's a very cool. You have to be sure it starts it goes into a light yellow and then it works its way in until it goes into a nice, uh, nice brown. Uh, once, once you get uh, the curing out of the way, and I'm jumping around if you don't, if you'll excuse me, uh, it's shipped into the warehouse and in the modern day, 
they had cardboard cartons lined with wax paper, and they put that, the tobacco went to that, and they put it in two rooms and brought it up to about 100 degrees. They let it ferment in those bales. When I started out, they had big bins, and they put 3,000 pounds of tobacco into those bins, and you put a thermometer in a tube inside the middle, and when it got up to around 95 or 100, they literally would take the tobacco that was on the top, set it aside, sides, middle, so forth, and reverse it. The bottom would become the top, the side would become the middle, and they would run it through that press like process. And after that process was, was done, it was ready to be uh, sorted along the way. Now, I am jumping a little, and I hope you'll bear with me, but seed size. I don't know if any of you have seen seed size, but a seed of, of tobacco is about as big as one coffee ground. Huh. And in order to sow it in the beds, or even to mix it in the trays, I think you mix it for the trays too, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. You, we would take a little, it's only a little vial of seed now, that would do a, a, a lot of trays, and we would mix it with lime or lime plaster, so when we sowed it, we could see where we were. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd have a bunch here, nothing there, and that wasn't approved, I'll tell you. That wasn't approved. Uh, now, the fields, uh, very expensive fertilizer. We had to put organic fertilizer on. Organic fertilizer will break down over a period of time, and you need to feed the plant over a period of time. So it would take roughly about one ton of fertilizer per acre that we put on the ground and harrowed it in to the soil before the machines went out and set it, and you had to watch it. Things could happen, could get heavy rain. You've seen them around here as well as I have. It washes the fertilizer down. In some cases, if the field is not low, it washes it out. So getting to, say, about 10, 10 days or so uh, uh, before your harvest, you take a hard look at it, and if you needed to, you could go in with nitrate of uh, soda and put that on, and that would generally bring it back. Now that had to be done by hand, because in the interim period on shade tobacco, the plants got up around the knee or shoulder on a waist high, and it had to be tied up so it wouldn't fall over. So the girls would take and put a, a string around the thing and attach it to a wire over every row. And that worked out pretty well, but not if you, you could put no equipment in there, so it would become by hand. Tobacco was very labor intensive, very labor intensive and the girls would tie it. And then you, at the same time, the plants would have a second growth between the leaf and the stalk. You've seen them on tomato plants or other stuff. You know how there's little things? Well, you had to get rid of those. So you put the kids on the ground, and they did. <laughs> and, and, the, and, the, and I can remember riding uh, through the various fields, uh, observing uh, this operation from farm to farm, and uh, you can see the kid, he's in the road, you know, and he's looking at you. And he's saying, look at that you-know-who sitting in that air-conditioned car, and I'm sitting on the ground sliding my rear. And, and I say to myself, kid, you don't know it. My father put me out there years ago. And that's what happened. I, I just have to make a quick comment. Many of you in here probably knew Katie Smikes. And one day she was describing how you would suck her tobacco or pick tobacco. She's put a burlap bag on your hiney, yeah. sit down on the ground and scoot them on ass. Scoot them on ass. Pick the leaf, scoot them on ass. Oh. Well, that's my little comment. That's she we're, was we're, the we're character. Scoot we're them we're on from ass. From <laughs> anyway, I thought I had to go in a tobacco business at about eight or eight or twelve years old. So uh, father, we lived right across from the Whitley Fire Station down here plowed up a little track of land, and uh, the, the crew came in and set it with machines, and I got told to hold it by hand. They didn't bother doing that. And then when it was ready to harvest, uh, his father, Sid, and my father, went out and they speared it. Now you take two fellows that are the overall supervisor of the uh, farms, and back in those days, they wore the, the suits and the vests in my day, I had short sleeve shirts. And you can imagine two brothers out there taking a lath 
and putting and putting five stalks on it. And they hadn't done a day's work in God knows how long. <laughs> but it was done. They were dressed to go to church, though. They basically were. <laughs> and, they, and so it was taken over and it was hung in one of the barns. Right there in the, in the farm, the barn's still there. And uh, I had to go out every morning before I went to school and uh, open up the side doors so the air would get in for the curing operation. But Father said to me, Harold, don't worry. I was in first or second grade at the city school here. And he said, you don't have to leave school midday. Stay there for the whole day. We'll take care of closing it up if it needs it. So I lost that one. <laughs> And I also uh, remember when I went out to get a job, this is back when I was 13, 14, I figured I was good for a tractor driver, you know, all these other jobs. Well, I went out with Dad and he talked to the superintendent on the farm and they went over the business of the day. And I was, you know, I'm saying, boy, I think I could handle one of those tractors. And uh, Father said, uh, Harold wants to talk to you. I said, this does not look good. <laughs> so I had to ask for my own job. And I ended up on what is known as the mountain farm, where you fellows raised trees up there, with a bag on my rear sliding up and down the road. <laughs> in the thing. And so, but it brought home this, the situation where later on when I was riding in the car, I appreciated the, the kids uh, uh, thinking that I had it made on it. And then the tobacco was all done. At the time, uh, I don't know how many thousand acres without looking, was grown in the valley. Uh, my father uh, bought for, and Howard Waite down the street here, purchased tobacco for Leslie Wells Swift, and he handled it here. And my father bought over 500, acre, uh, 500 acres a year for consolidated. And they shipped that to Suffield, Connecticut to be graded down there. Uh, now, Mine got sold to Uncle Leslie. And y'all, some of you must remember you had little red rider wagons that you pulled around, you played with. Well, one bale of that tobacco will fit into a little red rider wagon. And I hauled it over, and Uncle Leslie was going to be there. And oh God, I didn't know what was going to happen. And it went downstairs in the shop, and I was almost sweating. And Leslie said, he called me Jake, called my father Jake and Jake. Well, little Jake, he says, let's see what you got. And I'm saying, hadn't been to church lately, but, you know, maybe there's a chance. So, uh, Leslie broke the bale open, and he opened up a few leaves, and looked at it, and he said, well, Jake, it's a mighty fine crop. I think I better buy it. And he did. And he did. And boy, was I relieved. <laughs> yeah. You know, what are you going to do with a bale of tobacco nobody wants? You know? and, uh, but it was a good experience. And I can also remember with Leslie, uh, when Father was buying for the uh, Consolidated, and Leslie was still using this down here, the finished product he sold to Have a Tampa Cigar Company in Tampa, Florida. And in the summer, uh, they would come up and, and Father would tell the superintendent on that farm to provide men to load the cases, wooden boxes, with tobacco on the trailer. And they all were numbered. Really, they really kept track of tobacco. And Leslie would come up, at that time he lived in Northampton, with a list of invoice numbers that he wanted to go. So I'd go up there and I'd say, Uncle Leslie, 2131, very good. 2132, very good. But well, you know what I really liked? When at the end, Uncle Leslie said, Well, little Jake, he said, I think you did a pretty good job. And he reached in his vest and pulled out a dollar and gave it to me. Now, I never missed the trailer all summer long. I've got to tell you, <laughs> I was there every time. Uh, you know? Anyway, moving on. I've told you about the organic fertilizer and so forth. Yeah, Excuse me, I told you that uh, uh, Tobacco Valley runs from Portland, Connecticut to, to uh, uh, Greenfield, Mass. And the interesting part, and I didn't say this to you, but when I was riding south of Hartford for the company, I used to go over in Tryon Town to the Connecticut River. 
Yeah, across the little ferry there. Right, and there's a ferry. South class. And that was quite a, a deviation for the day. And I had tickets for it. You get on that ferry, it was a three-car ferry, and the tugboat took us across. And it, it was a, it just added to the day. You know, it, it gave you that break from having to pay attention to the serious side. But the other little, side is a little tidbit on that. That is the oldest continuing operating ferry in the United States. <laughs> yeah. it goes back, I don't know, 200, 300 years. That I didn't know, David, but I will tell between you. Between Rocky Hill and South Pass right. Ferry. But the thing that I do know about that thing is that a lot of bodies from the Mafia seem to end up in that hole, and you can see them scooping them out because their weight broke away from them. So that was the other side. <laughs> uh, well, broadleaf uh, tobacco, uh, basically, and Havana seed uh, that Wayne grows is cut and hung upside down in the shed. Uh, I, I don't know if you tie it, Wayne, or you put it all on the lath or not. Oh, all on the lath. All we on the used lath. to tie. We did all three. We tied, we speared, and we hooked. Yeah. And it was a. It, and it still has to be washed the same as shade tobacco as far as the moisture. If you have a lot of moisture getting that tobacco, you know, dry it off. The tips will get all cocked with all the black spots, and it's no good. It'll fall right apart on it. So you had to be careful. And the other thing, when I was out, when my father was buying on a Saturday and Sunday, you know, no school day, I got to go with him. And we went to various farmers, and uh, some thought, you know, I was a little kid, you know, and didn't know much. You know that kind of guy, arrogant? Well, I'll tell you, they piled these bundles too high. Most farmers did be at, at the early part of the season because you couldn't let too much heat in cool weather, they could stack them up. I picked every bottom bundle for that farmer so that he had to move the top bundles. I said, if you're going to be like that, I'm going to be like that. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the other thing is, they all argued about price, these are the, the farmers on the outside. When I was in Puerto Rico uh, with the company, uh, the gentleman that represented uh, Bayouk Cigar, which to you around here is Martin Middleson, if you remember the company, and uh, Col uh, General Cigar, which was Colbro or Coleman to you, and then uh, Consolidate. Those three gentlemen sat at a bar in Puerto Rico, and I'm telling you as I'm sitting here tonight, I'll bet you they set the price for tobacco within a few pennies, and you weren't going to change it. You weren't going to change it. And one thing about it, when Father bought tobacco, he uh, bought it uh, with a clause in there. I don't know if they still do that, Wayne, or not, do they? Sometimes. You so, try not to. Okay, let me, get, let me see. I got page two, so you're, I'm halfway done, so don't get excited and leave. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, a hundred acre tobacco farm, uh, we would figure 35 to 40 adults. This is during the harvest time. We would start off the farm with eight or 10 to get the seed beds ready and so forth. And it would take 50 to 60 girls for a hundred acre farm. And that's for actually running the sewing machines and piling the leaves on the tables and telling the girls, don't put the last tight against the, your side because it damages the leaves. Those are the ones that carried the lath that passed it to the ones that were hanging it up in the shed. The damage to the leaves, you can't use them. I'll tell you that right now. And, uh, and the boys, anytime you needed five boys to, to volunteer to go to the shed and give up piecework picking the leaves, you had ten fellows, or ten kids that raised them. All of them wanted to go in the barn with the girls. <laughs> Uh, we, uh, I'm jumping around a little bit. There was such a short shortage of kids when the three corporations were at their maximum that you couldn't get enough boys or girls to harvest the crop. So the companies, or my, or the company I worked for, and others did, they sent their uh, personnel men down to Florida and they hired groups of kids. And when they hired them, they hired the principal, they usually hired two teachers, the cooks, 
and so forth, and brought them up as a group, and they used to lease some of the fraternity and sorority houses over in Amherst, and they stayed there. Now that, that sounds, that was good. The only problem for a farm is you got kids from Florida or West Virginia or Pennsylvania, and you, and you can't let them set on the weekends doing nothing. So on the farming aspect, we used to have to provide our company buses to haul them to Riverside Park, to haul them there, and there. But it did work out. It did work out well, and the crop did get put away. The unfortunate part about some of it, like Florida starts their school year earlier than they do around here. So we had to kind of govern the, the crop so that it was harvested earlier on it. Oh, I gotta check a couple things off. Give me a second here. <laughs> well, Mr. Swift, Diane's There was also um, the building that's behind the Bow Wow um, bathhouse. I'll take that up. I'm glad you brought that up. Oh, did you? Okay. If you, I was if gonna you say, give, I me, remember. give me a second, yeah. Yeah. On it. Uh, just let me get rid of this other one first, please. <laughs> I've got, I think that's, uh, let me see here. Uh, okay, I've got that. Told you about the shortage of youth. Told you that. Uh, if I can go to the leaves first. Uh, usually, uh, broadleaf or Havana seed uh, was topped, and they topped it by walking down through the rolls and breaking off the top a little. And they used to put it, at waist high, and that way you've got nine or ten leaves that were usable. And uh, with the boys picking tobacco, and I know boys got different, we wanted a certain length because the first three leaves, if they were usable, uh, like all these, would shrink in length. So we used the basis of, of uh, arm length tobacco from the tip of the thing to the arm. Now, on uh, myself, that would be quite a leaf, but on a kid, it's shorter. And that's how we control the size of the tobacco that actually went into the sheds. It got hung up along the way. Oh, where are we here? Oh yeah, on shade tobacco, when times were real good, uh, I told you about the 18 the other, uh, we used to do 15 uh, to 18 leaves off the plants. And depending on the company, sometimes you picked it two leaves at a time, Sometimes you pick the three. Uh, now the leaves on top of the shade plant are coarser, but like all good companies, no one wants to lose money. So what do they do with the top leaves? On the top leaves, if you turn them upside down, they were shade lighter, and they put them on a less expensive cigars. Mm -hmm. On it, and uh, I can remember going to staff meetings where the people that ran this. Company would be in. We would. I was headquartered out of Glastonbury, Connecticut. And it's true. He said, "Remember, boys, we're going to set the gold up here." It's true of anything in your life. It's a lot easier to bring it down a little bit than to push it up. And he's right. If you think about that. It's easier to come down a little than keep pushing up. And that was the model that we had to operate by. And that's what we did. Uh, what did you want to know again? My, oh, no, my... It was just more of a comment that I remember, I live obviously on Christian Lane, and the building that's behind the Bow Wow bathhouse. Oh, okay, well, where I live, where I live. That, that, um, that brick, or that building there, that it did house, uh, we called them the Florida Girls, many years ago. That, that's correct. And I don't know who's Well, there's more to it than what you're saying, you know. There's Pardon. more to it than what you're saying. They were, at first, Consolidated was going to put the original camp, or well, my father put up the original addition over in Stunderland. That's the ones up where the uh, uh, PVGA vegetable thing is. And Sunderland got up, worked up, and so they, they put it up in Whitey, which is good because we got taxes off it. Now, the same thing basically happened on that one, it's, it's really behind my house. My property is it way out there, okay? The brooch. And, oh, we don't want any Puerto Ricans there. We don't want any et cetera, et cetera there, you know? So they got a permit in this town to put it up for youth only. And that's what went in there. And, and they also own the one up on Westbrook Road. There's a camp up there, if you're familiar with it. 
Uh, and uh, that belonged to Cobro too. Uh, and later years, uh, when Cobro uh, moved out, uh, I was charged to, uh, with one of their representatives to go around and talk to each property owner that Cobro and Martin Middleson, for fact, had under lease to see if we could bring them into our picture for the price that we wanted, that we could pay them, you know. Some accepted, some didn't on it. And one of the things that uh, we did was to take over that camp that you're talking about over there. And, and I told you a moment ago about how we have to provide buses to haul these kids here and there. Well, one of the things you used to have to do was haul them over to UMass for swimming. Okay, and bring them back. Well, they ran into a bunch of boys. <laughs> yeah, now the boys said the thing to do is pay the girls a call. So early one evening, uh, the girls were in the camp. Three or four carloads of boys came over from Amherst. And I live uh, at 162. That's about four houses back from uh, Long Plain Road. And there was no houses on either house uh, where Orlowski's was. And they tried to go through that field. Well, they got stuck with their cars. We had 30 state troopers and other policemen. They rounded them up. They didn't want to put them in the cruiser because they smelled so bad from rolling around further out. It's kind of swampy. But they never made it to the girls' camp. I'll tell you that. What year was that? What, what, that? Year, what year was that? A little after I was 21, I don't remember. <laughs> uh, I, I would say it was in the 70s. Yeah. Uh, I've seen a lot of things, I'll tell you. Uh, did a lot of undercover work for this company, too, that we're not going to talk about down in Connecticut. And, uh, well, I will tell you about one. And one day, why not? They had a problem. The one thing about this is a the inception of computers coming in, and they had ratios of so many boys, so many girls that were needed to run a farm, and the, the, the payroll wasn't running the way it should. And stuff seemed to be missing. So, using my own vehicle, uh, I staked it out, and I found that the men running the farm were cutting the poles that we used, red cedar, white cedar, and mixed a little bit of firewood from some trees around there and was selling it. Also, on the farm proper, they had a deal where uh, somebody could come in and buy a case of oil and so forth and, put, and parts that fit various equipment, and they were making money out of that. And they also had some boys that they hired in over the quota, and what were they doing? They were renting them out to an independent farmer for about five dollars more an hour uh, so he could put his broadleaf in and so they were making five dollars an hour on each one of those kids. Well it took a while to get to the bottom of it but we did and all one morning uh, I talked with the power to be in Glastonbury and his father Ronnie, I uh, knew Ronnie, Ronnie never worked directly under me but I knew of him and he put together a team of four or five people, you probably don't even remember this way, and he came down there and we hit the place. You would not believe. They, this group that did it, I did it right after they had been away on a trip to Bermuda or something, so they were broke when they came back. And they, we brought them in that morning, there was a farmhouse there, and a couple of the uh, wives were there, and they were yelling and screaming, at me from in the house, why was I doing this now? They just spent their money on Bermuda. And put, but anyway, we found out that they dug pits, put a piece of plastic down, put the parts in it, then covered it back up. And they were selling them. Well, that morning when word spread, to, and it was around Enfield, Connecticut, you can't imagine people were coming back with chainsaws, shovels, other stuff. Word spread pretty quick. and. Obvious to say that those gentlemen uh, are no longer, or were no longer with the company after we got done. But that's just one example of one of the things that I, I did in addition to the regular work along the way. Uh, the uh, overall, we had a very good group of honest people working for us. We really did, 
and the hours were sometimes longer than you wished along the way. One thing that happened when it was consolidated cigar, and you had to work, say, the 4th of July because of storm damage, they gave you, as a salary employee, they gave you that day off. But in October or November, when Gulf and Weston bought out consolidated, uh uh, new rules, you had to give that foreman a day off within a week of that holiday you worked. So things did kind of straighten out for the boys along the way. Uh, am I missing anything, David? Did you think You're of? doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hanging on your every word. Uh, I'm hoping. Uh, did I answer your question about the camp now? Yes, you did. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. One thing I think that uh, that I think is pertinent to all of us in Waitley and towns where we operated is. How does this affect the how does the tobacco business affect the economy of the area? And I use Whitney because I've lived here most of my life. All right. Now, where you see where you saw that there were tent poles and wires and so forth, the company had to pay a tax. This town got a tax for every acre of poles and wire, just like the utility poles out in the street. That brought in a sizable amount of money with all these companies. And the next thing was on the vehicles and so forth, I don't know if it's because the Swifts might have lived here more along, but I think uh, my predecessors, uh, his father and my father, there was a lot of vehicles registered in this town, so the excise tax came back to the town. All right. We did it, we had to do it in all towns, but. You know, you sometimes you add a truck here, a tractor there, and, and that's the way it works on it. Uh, the thing about it is, we're, we're jumping back to Broadleaf. When Father was buying Broadleaf, or Howard Waite was buying for uh, L.W. Swift, they offered a little partial payment because they usually bought it in October, November, and it. Unlike potatoes or onions that you grew in the summer, when you sold it, you got a check for it, and it went wherever, for your bills or whatever. But this was in, in anticipation of receiving the crop later on, because they couldn't handle that big an acreage all at once as far as warehousing it and grading it. So, uh, Father would usually, with about 20% of what he estimated the value of that crop to be. And that gave the farmers a little money for Christmas, for other things along the way. And the 20% clause that they put in there back then, and I don't know if you still got a clause in it now or not. No. Um, you try not to get one in there. Okay. The clause was if you had more than 20% damage, uh, then we took it out of you. <laughs> uh, the thing. And, uh, but it was nice to have the farmer get a few dollars to go through the holiday and into the upcoming season to do whatever he wanted. Take his wife on vacation, you know, do the dishes for her first so she could go, he could go, she'd say yes, and whatever. But that, that, was, uh, that was one of the benefits of uh, the tobacco business, because I don't know of any other crop, I know if you do, that will pay in advance of receiving the crop on it. And that's what we did. It all, it all basically all companies did it. Uh, I told you about my wagon and raised my one little bale of tobacco. And I must say that uh, I've enjoyed talking to you. I would leave you with the thought. Oh, I gotta tell you one more story. <laughs> Are you time for one more before I close? We had the uh, mold and the, and the bugs, the mold and whatever. And at one time, we used helicopters to come in and dust the crop. And helicopters were better than airplanes, not because they could get down in there closer, but the downdraft on that chopper would coat the underside of the leaves. The planes would coat the top side. Well, anyway, when I was a little younger, before I knew Martha, who never signed up for tobacco at all to work on it, how could I have ever married a girl that never even signed up for it, you know? But I didn't know that. Uh, 
I used to drive that truck with the dust and go around with the chopper. And I would go up with the in the chopper to look over the fields to be sure that they did the ones that belonged to us opposed to somebody else's. And uh, it was a uh, it was a very interesting thing to, to fly in a chopper the first time. I remember the first time I got in that chopper with him and they loaded it and he picked it up. Picked it up about four or five feet. And if any of you rode in the chopper, they put the nose down and I said, uh oh, this is bad. But he didn't go up. So <laughs> on it, you know. On it. In fact, it was so uh, so many times one year that we had a dust that I guess they had a guilty conscience. They were out of Warwick, Rhode Island, the helicopter company, and we all went to a cookout down in Suffield, Connecticut, and it was a very nice cookout, the usual type, and the chopper was there, and so the pilot offered the ladies to uh, go for a ride, so Martha, two ladies at a time, right Martha, got in the chopper, and I think she'll tell you tonight is one of the best rides that he took them up and, over Springfield. and they went over Hartford and Springfield um, and he, they saw everything. Then he sent it back down and took two more girls. So she lucked out on it uh, along the world, considering she never worked in tobacco. You know? <laughs> but, but you know what she did? She went and worked in a bank. Now maybe she's smarter than I thought. <laughs> anyway, uh, I guess I want to say that it's a very, it was a very intensive crop. You never knew about the storms. You had to live through them. You never knew what bugs were going to hit you, and you didn't know what kind of mold you were going to hit you. But I'll tell you, you could bet that one of them was going to get you before it was over. Thank you for listening to me. I've got two experts here. Take questions, Harold. Here, several. Yes. I have a question. When you said your father dropped the dollar in your hand, was it a silver dollar? I think it was, as a matter of fact. Because I'm trying to, I'm trying to think if they yeah. paid in silver dollars, because my yeah. father used to pay his health was, in silver dollars. This was dollars. back a number of years ago. Yeah. Right. I'm sorry, man. Could you talk about the sorting houses? How many people worked there? How long did they run? Yes, I, I don't have any numbers, uh, uh, but what happened was. Uh, it went through the sweating operation, as you may know. And then it came out and it was weighed and bundled. And both the ladies who did the sorting and the men who did the sizing, according to the length of tobacco, that was the size of, of the bundle. If the bundle was short tobacco, then they didn't put as much in it. But if the longer leaves, they put more in it because obviously they could go through it fast. And they made uh, the sorting operation with shade is, uh, oh, I guess we probably made it into 20 grades. You had, you, had light, you had lights, medium lights, and so forth. And then on the dark side, you had uh, darks, mediums, lights. And then you had the leaf that had the hole on one side. That was an XLM. That meant that it could go into the factory and get cut on one side and use part of it. But it, it, it uh, these bundles, after they were uh, sorted by the ladies, went over to the sizes. And the sizes group had boxes that they worked on that had different uh, lengths cut in, so they would size it over and they would tie it out. Now that worked pretty good, but you also got a couple smart ones there, and this actually happened. He got brought upstairs to that gentleman who was running it in charge, Jack Ritter. <laughs> He brought a pair of scissors in. <laughs> he went and he snipped off all the ends of the leaves so they all were perfect and he finally got caught. Well, I'm just to say he was on a plane and at that point in time, uh, most all the foreign help came out of uh, an area near Bradley Field in Connecticut. And I will tell you by, uh, by afternoon he was in Bradley Field. But they brought him in to appear before the gentleman that was there. Uh, general manager at that time, he came in with almost a three-piece suit on. It's a good question to ask. And it took Jack, his name was Jack. Jack looked at him. He never had any experience in all his years in the tobacco business about this. So he said to the guy, I happened to be there, why are you dressed up in your suit? And he says, sir, he says, 
I've learned in my country that if you're going to go before the judge, you better be dressed. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't know what to say. Uh, but but the girl, it, made, it made a good job for women who, you know, needed a, a job during the winter, going back to even over here. Uh, that we talked about the uh, Broadleaf tobacco. Uh, I don't know how many busloads we actually had out of them. We got them out of Turner's, Greenfield, wherever. And then you had a few that drove in. Did they go all winter? Or how? The operation, well, it depended on how much crop you had. But uh, we could make it go all winter. And we could not make it go all winter. It generally started right after, around the 1st of November to the 15th of November is when we started it. And they would go through the different grades, front the first grade, the second grade, and so forth, which was the, the bottom through the uh, top of the lead. And if you couldn't handle it, we had a big, big operation in Glastonbury, Connecticut. And they were, ran that much longer down there to take the slack out of it. What you wanted to do was keep the nucleus that you needed in the spring of males available to go out the 1st of April and get the seed beds ready, get the things ready along the way. Uh, one of the things that, w that went out over the, I don't think they did it, was a gentleman down the street, Mr. Wait, he, he represented some insurance company insuring uh, the crops too. Yeah, he was my grandfather. Oh, was he? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I have to, well, I'll, now that you say that, I'll, I'll comment on Howard if you don't, if you don't mind. As long as it's uh, Howard, <laughs> heard a lot of stuff. Howard, Howard was one of the most forward-thinking men. He, that barn that's down there now, he's the first one that went out and put uh, propane gas in and burners to cure his tobacco. And when Howard put up a crop, it was clean. There was no trash. He was the same way. He grew onions, I believe, too, and some other things. He had a barn here, the yellow barn here, and I believe he had a barn that set way back up in. He built that. He he went up to Brattleboro to get the wood for that. Did he really? Himself. Now, I think he's the first one that had irrigation. That's one thing about uh, the company with Uncle Leslie and, and Oak. They fought putting irrigation in for the longest time up here. Then they finally did along the way. Now, that farm that's on the corner down here uh, where you see the greenhouses going up, oh, yeah. now that, that was uh, Leslie's farm. And there was pipes in that farm, as I understand it, as a kid uh, growing up. Instead of using them, listen, they had them all dug up, and they took them up to what we call the Sugarloaf Farm, which is up where the uh, PVGA is, and they put them in for drinking lines. They would not irrigate. They would not irrigate. And I had so much fun over there. My mother, rest her soul, uh, used to go down to that pond and he had pond, and go out on that. If she ever saw me skating on that ice, I'll tell you, you just never knew. Or we slid down and the brook, the brook came in. There was a tile between that pond where you see that pipe, if it's still there, that runs all the way over to the brook that brought water in so that they could pump water. And there was a little building there. There were gigantic pumps that that person had for irrigating. So it's probably the inception of irrigation at that time on it. But, uh, well, I can't tell any more stories about down there because I would be in trouble, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah, maybe I ought to tell you one more. <laughs> Mom and Dad used to go for a ride on, on Saturdays and Sundays. Oh, Harold, come on, let's, we're going to go. Oh, I think I'll stay home today. Well, all right, Father would say, Mother. And they'd take my sister Sandra and off the door. Well, let me tell you, over in that farmyard, there were four or five ton and a half size trucks. And guess who went over and climbed up in them? And guess who rode the trucks around the farm to drive out, learn how to back up and so forth? Did pretty well, but you know, 18 year old a little shorter than I am now, and I don't know what happened. But I, I backed one of those trucks up. And the uh, next day, Dad came and one thing I'll say, my father never spanked me. Uh, he said, uh, now just what did you do while mom and sister and I were gone? I said, I think I got a problem. <laughs> it seemed I locked up the transmission on one of the trucks because I wasn't long enough to get the clutch 
all the way in. So that terminated my driving on weekends. <laughs> but it was really a learning experience growing up on the farm and, and uh, uh, not only my father, but his father, Sidney, uh, and uh, Uncle Leslie. I learned a lot about dealing with people, just watching my father deal with people uh, buying tobacco along the way. And you know, some of these people, they'd go in to buy the crop, my father would, and he was a senior person. So what did they have? They had three daughters, two sons there, and they're, I'll use the bad expression, crying that, oh, grandpa's so poor, he needs the money, you know, and they had, like myself, they had the limits of what you could pay. We could offer up to a certain amount. Yes, I tried to get it for cheaper than I could, that's what I was getting paid for, you know. And, but I'll tell you, nine out of ten times, that phone would ring, and father would own that crop the next day because they knew they couldn't get any further on it. But, but it, was a, it was a good experience, not only dealing with the people that we dealt with uh, on the farms, but with the people more so that I had to deal with leasing property and so forth. And, uh, you know, I didn't know these people. Connecticut thinks they got a better way of doing this. You get down there, same product, same outcome on it. But you're not going to get in an argument with them. If they think they're better, let them think that way as long as the crop is what they want on it. But you, when you think of the, between the three companies, you think of the number of kids that they hired in this valley to the extent that they had to go out and bring kids in from Florida, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. I think that's a sign that I'm supposed to stop talking. <laughs> I think that I've had it now, sir. What time of year did the farmers get the remaining 80% payment? Whenever they could take delivery of the tobacco. Uh, we tried it, my father tried to stockpile it, uh, but you know, they could only hold so much. They didn't want to gamble too much but because of fire like this barn down here. Uh, once the crop went in and once it was sorted, that's when they basically got their money. It was an effort to help the farmer uh, through the holidays, maybe he wanted to buy his fertilizer for next year, a down payment on it, and, and things like that. And, but I don't, and else you do, know of any other crop you grow that loans your money ahead of, of receiving the crop to any great extent. Okay. And and tobacco, I, I can't remember where or how long we used to store the bundles or when they went out. I'm sorry. On field grown. I can't remember when the bundles were shipped out or where they were stored. I can remember stripping and putting them together, but... Um, well, they were, they were taken in during the course of the winter. And I can remember that in a couple cases, my father paid the farmer two cents a pound more than he would have normally paid you, but the fellow trucked it all the way to Suffield, Connecticut for him. So it was cheap trucking for my father opposed to putting our own trucks on the road to haul that tobacco on it. Harold, <clears throat> what effect did that snowstorm have at that time, which was what, about, uh, how many years ago was it? Well, when they had that snowstorm, Harold was, was the superintendent on the farm that's up in the plains where the new town hall is. And Harold drove up that morning and found 110 acres that he was growing flat on the ground, broken and everything with about a little bit of snow. And being a big corporation, they were able to bring in uh, crews out of the other consolidated farms uh, down below, bust them up here every day, and bought every uh, tent post that they could. And it was kind of a bad deal because they were buying some of these tent poles out of uh, uh, Maine and New Hampshire and they knew they had a problem, so they would double charge them or charge them 20% more per pole to bring it down. Well, needless to say, they never went back to buy any poles from those people again. But we basically put that together and I put a crop in the ground in about 25 days. Think about that. That's going in there and raising up all the wires, putting all new poles in, and planting tobacco. But I tell you, it was from the time the sun came up till the time the sun went down. But what would only been accomplished 
because a company the size of uh, Consolidated or Cobro was big enough to bring in farms from Connecticut to help out. And uh, we're just lucky, just lucky we came out of it that good. But that's one thing that, that I always worried about was snow. And, so, and on the other one is hail. Hail will take and cut a crop to, uh, spot in short order. Uh, that was the only good thing about the net. The tent over it helps you would catch some of the hail. And uh, so that you could survive a, a mild, a mild uh, hail storm and so forth, as long as it didn't go down too far. The other thing was fire. At first we had just cotton cloth on the sides and the top, and then they went to ore line. Well, come the 4th of July, we had to put men out on each farm riding around the fields just in case there was any, uh, you know, those kind of kids that decided to torch it. It did happen. And once the cloth burned, the residue from that cloth would hit the leaves, and that leaf was never would turn the right color. It would, would that hit, it wouldn't. And it, it was, uh, we just, we're just lucky here. Uh, when they built, over here, when they built uh, the extension from Sugarloaf Mountain over to Route 5, that section in there, uh, the company was burning uh, brush there. They were clearing that road. I think it was Warner Brothers. And they lit the piles. And all the residue, the wind came out of the, the uh, north, uh, northwest and it blew it right onto the field. And they ended up paying for a good many acres of tobacco there on it. Uh, Orlon, Orlon uh, the, originally what happened is we had cotton cloth on top, okay? And they would take half the co cotton cloth on top and they would use it for siding on the next year. But once it changed, we ended up just with Orlon. They rolled it back and tied it up. If you want an example of it, uh, Mr. Hukowski has got his rolled up on his blueberry patch on Long Plain Road because he learned well from his father and uh, it'll roll up. Isn't that, didn't that, isn't that what you did yeah. on it? It's and, a test field. Uh, it's a test field. Well, I'll tell you what. I knew his dad and I knew they had to pass a serious test. They got away with nothing. They got away with nothing. I think Wayne would tell you that, if he, and, he doesn't, and he's not the kind that wants to talk, but he tells the story of how we first started farming. He thought it was a snap, so his grandfather, they put him out there weeding onions over in Hadley. Yeah, and there was no, no coffee break, Wayne? No. None at all. <laughs> and it went on, so he has a good basis for what he does. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Swift, I apologize if you already addressed this because I came in a few minutes late, but do you have a number of how many farmers in Waitley were farming tobacco? I don't, but I'll tell you, anybody that had a little plot of land did it because it brought in. It didn't matter if you grew an acre or two, it was getting bought along the way. It, it, they came out with homogenized tobacco. This is what killed it. Homogenized tobacco is they simply took good tobacco, whole, whatever, round it up, and it came out just like you, they make paper. And they sliced it according to the size they needed. The problem was, it wasn't totally accepted because it was water soluble when you put the cigar in your mouth. And so then they had to come out with a heavier thing to put on the end. And uh, that sort of slid away. That sort of slid away. You would not believe, I've been into the uh, factories where they actually made the cigars, and you can't imagine. They take a leaf and they put it through a machine. They make and it's right hand cuts and left hand sides, and they wrap that leaf. Depending on the side, those people know how many cigars they can get out of it. And when they wrap a cigar, the thick part of the vein, which is near the stem, is rolled so it doesn't show. You see the thinner part of it on the outside. On it, and then another trick. I don't know why I'm telling you these tricks. You're not going to grow, make cigars anyway, but I will. Is that if you bought a box of cigars to give uh, one of your relatives, okay, and you open that box of cigars, you would see the top layer of the cigar were almost identical in color to make an eye appeal. Look down into the second or third row, and that's where you see the off-colored cigars. On it. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we should thank our friend here for doing this, and our ice cream and cake is over here for anyone who would like to partake. And thank you very much. Thank you.
I want to thank, I want to thank David and Wayne for supporting me. Absolutely.